great neighborhood. VOA1, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Brian Lynn. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up, Andrew Smith presents Ask a Teacher. We also have words and their stories from Ana Mateo. And we close the show with an American story. But first... German automaker Volkswagen VW ended production of its Beetle model in 2019. But some communities around the world are still demonstrating a lasting love for this famous vehicle. One such area is Cuauhtepec, a neighborhood outside of Mexico City. There are so many VW Beetles in the area that some local people even nicknamed the neighborhood Bocholandia. In Mexico, the VW Beetle has long been known as the Bocho. So the term Bocholandia means beetle land. The vehicle has a long history in the Mexican capital. At one time, VW Beetles were commonly used as taxis throughout the city. But today, the northern neighborhood of Cuauhtepec is the place to go to see the most beetles, which are also called bugs in English. Jeanette Navarro is the owner of a 1996 beetle. Navarro lives in the neighborhood. She told the Associated Press, AP, one reason the cars are so popular is because the community is hilly and the Beetle's back-positioned engine provides added power. No other car gets up here, Navarro said, just the Bocho. She drives her VW as a taxi. Navarro added that she started the job eight years ago to support her three children. The job helped her put them through school. When they ask me what I do for work, I say proudly that I'm a bochera, a bocho driver, Navarro said. This work keeps me afloat. It's my adoration, my love. The first beetle was introduced in Germany in 1938, when the Nazi party controlled the country. The first vehicle was developed by Austrian-born automotive engineer Ferdinand Horsche. The beetle grew to become very popular in the United States and in other countries. It was long known as the people's car. Beetles were manufactured in Mexico, but production on older models ended in 2003. A newer model was produced after that, but VW stopped all manufacturing of the vehicles in 2019. While some older cars in the community show their age, others still appear to be in good shape. One driver named his bright blue beetle Guadalupita after his wife Guadalupe and added personal designs. Another beetle seen rolling down the street was painted pink and white with the front headlights made to look like cat eyes. People who repair the vehicles told the AP it seems like the number of bochos is dropping off in Mexico City. Repairman David Enojosa said his family's shop used to specialize mainly in beetle parts. 
But since VW halted production five years ago, they are no longer as easy to get. Enohosa predicted that if shortages continue, the area's beetles could disappear in two or three years. He added, before we had too many parts for bochos. Now there aren't enough. One of Enohosa's customers told the AP he plans to keep looking for parts to keep his beetle running as long as possible. The customer, Jesus Becerra, said he would love to keep seeing many cars in the neighborhood for many years. You adapt them, you find a way to make it keep running, he told the AP. Joaquin Perez is the 18-year-old owner of a white 1991 VW Beetle. He said he is carrying on a family tradition by continuing to drive the car as a taxi. His father was a taxi driver who also drove a Beetle. Perez noted that his father taught him everything he knows about the job and the vehicles. This area, always, always since I can remember, has been a place of bochos, Perez said. He added, this here is the car of the people. I'm Brian Lynn. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from Madur about the usage of had only and only had in English. Hi. I would like to clear my concept regarding usage of had only and only had in written English. Thank you for writing, Madur. I'm happy to answer this question. In general, differences in meaning between had only and only had depend on the situation. And in many cases, there is no difference in meaning between the two. In spoken English, the tone of voice we use helps make the meaning clear. But without the help of the voice, a writer must write carefully to avoid confusion about had only and only had. Let's look at the usage of these terms with the following three cases. Case 1. The same sentence, two meanings. Consider two situations. In the first, you wanted to give something to drink to five people, but you only had enough to give two people drinks. In this situation, the sentence, I only had two drinks, means you did not have enough drinks for five people. It expresses the idea that there was a problem. In the second situation, Someone said you drank too much alcohol at a party, but you disagreed. So, you said, I only had two drinks. In this case, you have expressed the idea that there was not a problem with how much you drank. So, the same sentence, I only had two drinks, can express a problem or the lack of a problem. The sentence, I only had two drinks, by itself, without any situation connected to it, is ambiguous. Ambiguous means that something is unclear because it can be understood in more than one way. Case 2. Two different sentences, same meaning. Consider these two sentences. We had only one liter of water. We only had one liter of water. Each sentence can mean that there is a problem, 
that we needed more than one leader. In general, when the adverb only follows the verb had, the adverb is closer to the object of the sentence and helps show that there is, or might be, a problem. Case 3. Two sentences, different meanings. The sentence, we had only one liter of water, usually means that we wanted or needed more water. On the other hand, we only had one liter of water might mean that there is no problem. For example, if there were 50 liters of water, drinking one liter would usually not be a problem. The examples from all of the above cases help us see how important it is to explain the situation. That is because only had can have two meanings, depending on the situation. Last, there is another use of had only, which comes from conditional statements, such as the following. If I had only been there sooner, I could have seen her. Here, the use of had only, following the word if, expresses regret. We hope this explanation helps you, Madur. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Andrew Smith. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Do you have a friend, co-worker, or family member who you are very close with? Do you often work on projects or activities with that person? If so, the two of you could be called partners in crime. And those projects or activities are not even illegal. Partners in crime is an expression that describes two or more people who are very close to each other. But more than being close, they are usually involved in playful or adventurous activities. Even though the expression has the word crime, the activities are, more often than not, legal ones. Originally, the expression may have described actual criminals, but today it does not. It is a fun, light-hearted way to describe close friends who may be involved in some kind of mischief. Not surprisingly, the expression is often used in mystery stories, films, and television shows. The most famous example is Partners in Crime, a collection of short stories by Agatha Christie, published in 1929. The stories were turned into a radio broadcast and then a television program. Besides partners in crime, we also have a similar expression, thick as thieves, to describe very close friends who share information and secrets. Now, let's talk about some more words that are similar or related to partners in crime. Someone who is your partner in crime can also be called your sidekick. A sidekick is someone who is usually by your side. If your sidekick is helping you in a social situation, like meeting members of the opposite sex, then we can call them a wingman or wingwoman. In airplane talk, a wingman is a pilot who flies his aircraft behind the leading pilot. There are other, more formal or official words to describe a partner in crime, such as collaborator or accomplice. Although, you may want to be careful when using the word accomplice. 
When talking about a real crime, an accomplice is a person who helps others do something illegal. Now let's hear this expression used in a couple of examples. In the first one, two friends talk about a great party. How did you manage to throw such a great party? You thought of everything. I couldn't have done it without my partner in crime, Emma. Where is she anyway? Emma, your party collaborator, is on the karaoke machine and is about to start the singing contest. At a girl, Emma. Now let's hear this expression used in a work situation. Are Michael and Evan working on another project together? They are. Those two have been partners in crime ever since they started working together. You're right, and it's a good thing for us. They are a great team and collaborate really well together. And that's all the time we have for this words and their stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. We present the short story, "The Ransom of Red Chief." By O. Henry. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. It looked like a good thing, but wait till I tell you. We were down south in Alabama, Bill Driscoll and myself, when this kidnapping idea struck us. It was a town down there as flat as a pancake, and called Summit. Bill and I had about six hundred dollars. We needed just two thousand dollars more for an illegal land deal in Illinois. We chose for our victim the only child of an influential citizen named Ebenezer Dorset. He was a boy of ten. With red hair, Bill and I thought that Ebenezer would pay a ransom of two thousand dollars to get his boy back. But wait till I tell you. About two miles from Summit was a little mountain covered with cedar trees. There was an opening on the back of the mountain. We stored our supplies in that cave. One night. We drove a horse and carriage past Old Dorset's house. The boy was in the street throwing rocks at a cat on the opposite fence. "Hey, little boy," says Bill, "would you like to have a bag of candy and a nice ride?" The boy hits Bill directly in the eye with a piece of rock. That boy put up a fight like a wild animal. But at last we got him down in the bottom of the carriage and drove away. We took him up to the cave. The boy had two large bird feathers stuck in his hair. He points a stick at me and says, "Ha, pale face! Do you dare to enter the camp of Red Chief, the terror of the plains?" He's all right now," says Bill, rolling up his pants and examining wounds on his legs. We're playing Indian. I'm Old Hank, the trapper, Red Chief's captive. I'm going to be scalped at daybreak by Geronimo. That kid can kick hard. Red Chief says, "I to the boy, would you like to go home?" Ah,、oh, what for? Says he. I don't have any fun at home. I hate to go to school. I like to camp out. You won't take me back home again, will you? Not right away, says I. We'll stay here in the cave for a while. All right, says he. That'll be fine. I never had such fun in all my life. <laughs> We went to bed about eleven o'clock. Just at daybreak, 
I was awakened by a series of terrible screams from Bill. Red Chief was sitting on Bill's chest with one hand holding his hair. In the other, he had a sharp knife. He was attempting to cut off the top of Bill's head based on what he had declared the night before. I got the knife away from the boy, but after that event, Bill's spirit was broken. He lay down, but he never closed an eye again in sleep as long as that boy was with us. Do you think anybody will pay out money to get a little imp like that back home? Bill asked. Sure, I said. A boy like that is just the kind that parents love. Now, you and the chief get up and make something to eat while I go up on the top of this mountain and look around. I climbed to the top of the mountain. Over toward summit, I expected to see the men of the village searching the countryside, but all was peaceful. Perhaps, says I to myself, it has not yet been discovered that the wolves have taken the lamb from the fold. I went back down the mountain. When I got to the cave, I found Bill backed up against the side of it. He was breathing hard with the boy threatening to strike him with a rock. He put a red-hot potato down my back, explained Bill, and then crushed it with his foot. I hit his ears. Have you got a gun with you, Sam? I took the rock away from the boy and ended the argument. I'll fix you, says the boy to Bill. No man ever yet struck the Red Chief but what he got paid for it. You better be careful. After eating, the boy takes a leather object with strings tied around it from his clothes and goes outside the cave, unwinding it. Then we heard a kind of shout. It was Red Chief holding a sling in one hand. He moved it faster and faster around his head. Just then I heard a heavy sound and a deep breath from Bill. A rock, the size of an egg, had hit him just behind his left ear. Bill fell in the fire across the frying pan of hot water for washing the dishes. I pulled him out and poured cold water on his head for half an hour. Then I went out and caught that boy and shook him. If your behavior doesn't improve, says I, I'll take you straight home. Now, are you going to be good or not? I was only funnin', says he. I didn't mean to hurt old Hank, but what did he hit me for? I'll behave if you don't send me home. I thought it best to send a letter to old man Dorset that day, demanding the ransom and telling how it should be paid. The letter said, We have your boy hidden in a place far from Summit. We demand $1,500 for his return. The money to be left at midnight tonight at the same place and in the same box as your answer. If you agree to these terms, send the answer in writing by a messenger tonight at half past eight o'clock. After crossing Owl Creek on the road to Poplar Cove, there are three large trees. At the bottom of the fence, opposite the third tree, will be a small box. The messenger will place the answer in this box and return immediately to Summit. If you fail to agree to our demand, 
you will never see your boy again. If you pay the money as demanded, he will be returned to you safe and well within three hours. I took the letter and walked over to Poplar Cove. I then sat around the post office and store. An old man there says he hears Summit is all worried because of Ebenezer Dorset's boy having been lost or stolen. That was all I wanted to know. I mailed my letter and left. The postmaster said the mail carrier would come by in an hour to take the mail on to Summit. <laughs> At half past eight, I was up in the third tree, waiting for the messenger to arrive. Exactly on time, a half-grown boy rides up the road on a bicycle. He finds the box at the foot of the fence. He puts a folded piece of paper into it and leaves, turning back toward Summit. I slid down the tree, got the note, and was back at the cave in a half hour. I opened the note and read it to Bill. This is what it said. Gentlemen, I received your letter about the ransom you ask for the return of my son. I think you're a little high in your demands. I hereby make you a counter-proposal which I believe you will accept. You bring Johnny home and pay me $250, and I agree to take him off your hands. You had better come at night, because the neighbors believe he is lost, and I could not be responsible for what they would do to anybody they saw bringing him back. Very respectfully, Ebenezer Dorset. Great pirates of Penzance, says I, of all the nerve. But I looked at Bill and stopped. He had the most appealing look in his eyes I ever saw on the face of a dumb or talking animal. Sam, says he, what's $250 after all? We've got the money. One more night of this boy will drive me crazy. I think Mr. Dorset is making us a good offer. You aren't going to let the chance go, are you? Tell you the truth, Bill, says I. This little lamb has got on my nerves, too. We'll take him home, pay the ransom, and make our getaway. We took him home that night. We got him to go by telling him that his father had bought him a gun and we were going to hunt bears the next day. It was twelve o'clock when we knocked on Ebenezer's front door. Bill counted out two hundred and fifty dollars into Dorset's hand. When the boy learned we were planning to leave him at home, he started to cry loudly and held himself as tight as he could to Bill's leg. His father pulled him away, slowly. Uh, how long can you hold him? asked Bill. I'm not as strong as I used to be, says old Dorset. But I think I can promise you ten minutes. Enough, says Bill. In ten minutes, I shall cross the central, southern, and middle western states and be running for the Canadian border. And as dark as it was, and as fat as Bill was, and as good a runner as I am, he was a good mile and a half out of Summit before I could catch up with him. <laughs> That's all the time we have for today's show, but join us again tomorrow 
for another VOA Learning English program. Thanks for listening. I'm Katie Weaver.